I would like to actually today at least start with putting things in a longer term perspective. I know we're all focused on the very short term and also with the global, a global spin. You know, everyone's talking about global weakness and the effect it might be having on the U.S. market. So I wrote a message last Saturday. You have it right up there. Uh, S&P still in record territory, but looking vulnerable. Okay, weekly indicators show some loss of upside momentum. What I'm really focused on is, uh, yes, the U.S. market was, uh, was in record highs. It still is very close to it. But when you look around the world, the world looks a lot weaker. And that really concerns me a little bit because it's very hard for the U.S. to carry the, the burden all by itself. So if uh, we go to the charts, you'll see what I'm actually talking about. Uh, just the first chart here. Remember, this is last Saturday. It's a weekly chart. I think when I really want to get a, a sense of real trends, I, I generally go to weekly or monthly charts. This is the S&P 500 now. You can see very clearly in the lower box there, it hit a record high, and that's all well and good. But if you draw a trend line, and I've seen other people on our site showing the same thing. If you draw a trend line over the highs of last year, we're sitting right on that trend line. So right off the bat, that um, means we're up against some resistance. So that's, that, that's basically all I'm saying here. By the way, the, uh, the, the blue and the red line there, um, we did slip below the 50-day moving, 10-week uh, uh, moving average this week. We held at the, the red line, which is a very good sign. But anyway, the whole point of this is just to show that uh, the S&P looked a little bit vulnerable from a technical standpoint going into this week. And if you look at the, the two indicators on the top there, the top line is the nine-week relative strength index. And I was simply trying to make the case that, that when you see that blue arrow, uh, that shows that the, the high that was set in July is lower than the high that was set in the spring. And as we all know, that is a, a, a negative divergence. Again, warning that this move into record highs is, is a little suspicious um, and, and maybe not as strong as it looks. And then finally, if you just move down to the middle indicator there, that's the weekly MACD lines. They don't look that bad, but if you look at the uh, the histogram, those those are green bars there. I like to look at those. Those actually measure the, the distance or the spread between the other two lines. And you'll notice a negative divergence there as well. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You see that little falling trend line. So when I look at the, the S&P up against that trend line, uh, loss of upside momentum in some of those indicators, indicates to me that the market was vulnerable for some type of a pullback, and we appear to be getting that now. But that's the U.S. by itself. What really concerns me is the next two charts. We can move down to chart two. This is the, um, this is the all country um, uh, iShare, MSCI, all country world index iShares at the blue bar. Now, this includes all the markets in the world. It includes the U.S. In fact, the U.S. accounts for a little over half. Of, of the uh, of the global picture, the rest of it is cons is uh, cons uh, composed of a foreign developed and emerging markets. This gives you a very different picture. It shows that the recent high that we have this summer is just a retest of the highs from last um, September. The re the reason it looks weaker than the prior chart is because it includes foreign stocks which have been weaker. And this raises a little bit of a uh, Little, little more concern for me because it just shows that we are up against the highs of last year. The indicators on the top also show overbought and some negative divergences, uh, which indicates to me once again that the global, the global picture uh, is also due for some type of a pullback and it's also looking somewhat vulnerable. Now, we did get a pullback this week. Uh, we did hold above. We actually they, we actually touched that red line there, which is the 40-week moving average, and we have bounced off it. So that that's all well and good, but uh, I'm still a little bit concerned that uh, I don't think that uh, we've seen enough over the last couple of days to suggest that this thing is ready to move into new highs. I think we still have a lot of uh, intermediate-term problems to deal with, and I wouldn't be surprised if we just backed and filled up for the next couple of months. But that's this, this, this is the chart that includes the U.S. Now, let's look at what's happening to the rest of the world without the U.S. And this paints a very, very different picture. This is the, once again, the MSCI, All Country World Index, XUS. This is what the rest of the world is doing outside of the U.S. And it's not a very strong picture. You can see, uh, the, the, and this is, by the way, includes developed and emerging markets. You can see it hit a record high uh, at the beginning of 2018 along with us. We, we sold off uh, 
during 218. But you'll notice that the rally that we've had since the end of last year has only retraced 62%, which, you know, we always measure these Fibonacci retracements. And as we all know, the, uh, the third one on the top there, the 62% retracement, that is usually the key one. Uh, and you can see that uh, this thing just rallied right up to the 62% level, uh, where uh, also a test of the highs from uh, late last year where that blue arrow is. And again, uh, it weakened. Now, we, hit, we over this last week, we retested those lows and we're bouncing a little bit today. But this, is, this worries me a little bit because, um, yes, we know the U.S. stock market is the strongest stock market in the world. But it can't do it by itself. And, you know, the concept of breath, you know, we talk about breath when we talk about uh, breath in the U.S. market, the advanced decline line, for example. You know, in a bull market, we need to see more stocks rising than falling. Well, there's such a thing as global breath also. When we have one market like the U.S. market, even though it is the uh, probably the, it is the biggest market in the world, even though we see that hitting a new high, when we look when we look around the rest of the world, the rest of the world isn't following, and, and I, would, I would refer to this as a negative divergence. We have one market hitting a new high, and nobody else is doing that. So global breadth, to me, isn't as strong as I, as I would like it to be. This worries me a little bit. Um, it's, it's one thing to have uh, foreign stocks not ri uh, rising less fast than us. Let's put it that way. We've all been rising. But it's one thing to have them start to fall. And we've seen that in a lot of these markets. Uh, we've seen Asian markets really take a hit this week. Emerging markets have been very weak, led by China. We're seeing weakness in Europe. Um, everywhere else around the world, we're seeing weakness. And uh, that worries me. It, it worries me if the rest of the world is weakening, or if some of these markets start to go into recession. Europe, for example, very close to that. It makes me worry that sooner or later, this is going to begin to affect our market. We saw a little bit of that this week. Uh, so this, this is one of the things that has me a little bit concerned that the longer range picture for the, for the global market and for the U.S. market isn't as strong as I would like it to be. Now, do you have any questions on that, Aaron? Can I just move on? Or? I believe we're good in the chat room. Good. Okay. So let's, so I have, speaking of breath, I want to move on to one more message, which is one that I wrote um, on Tuesday, I believe it is. I think it's August the end. Not that one. Yeah, this one. Same, same basic concept, slightly different spin to it. I wrote this on Tuesday. Stock market needs broader, broader sector participation. Six market sectors have yet to hit a new high. First of all, there were 11 market sectors. Okay. Six of them have not hit a new high. Five of them have, and, and, and of the five that have, three of them are defensive sectors. We have REITs, we have utilities, and we have consumer staples. They have been the strongest, they have been among the strongest sectors in the stock market. And as you know, uh, as we all know, those are defensive sectors. And it's not normally, in a bull market, you, you want to see economically sensitive sectors leading don't want to see the, the these kinds of group leading on the upside. Now we know why that's happening because these these are dividend paying stocks. They're bond proxies. So because we had a uh, a collapse in, in bond yields uh, all over the world and in treasury bond yields, that has pushed bond prices sharply higher. And of course, that has pushed money into these into these uh, dividend paying stocks in a search for yield. We understand why that's happening, but still, it's very very unusual especially in late cycle work. When you see money flowing into REITs, utilities, and consumer staples, defensive stocks, that is often very symptomatic of late cycle activity. It's not the kind of activity you want to see in a very, very strong bull market. So having said that, let me move on to the two other sectors that have hit new highs. There are two, two other sectors that have hit new highs. No surprise here. One is the technology index. This is the XLK. You can see it clearly hitting a new high. And uh, we, we've had a pullback over the last week. And you can see we're testing the January highs. So I just, nothing too important going on there. By the way, we, that little green line that I drew there uh, showing that arrow, you can see that uh, we have bounced off that. So that normally a previous peak like that does act as a uh, support level. So that's good news. So there's, there's nothing, no serious damage being done in the technology sector. But the main point here was simply to show this was one of the few sectors hitting a new high. 
Now, if we move down to the second one, here's another economically sensitive group that has done very well, also hitting a new high. Um, so this, this is good. This is good for the market when technology and, and, uh, and discretionary stocks are in the lead. You can see that I wrote this red circle, put that red circle in when we, we, we slip under that green line. We're back above it today. So, so that, that's very good news. Interestingly, by the way, just as long as we have consumer discretionary in front of us, I was, I've been following the groups within this, uh, within this sector over the last week. And if you look at what's been leading it, it's, it's housing stocks, home building stocks. Um, if you look at the within this group, and that makes perfect sense also because with bond yields plunging, this is very, very good for the housing industry, very good for home building. We, within this group, we're seeing weakness in retail stocks for obvious reasons, even auto stocks to a certain extent. But the real leadership over the last, last couple of weeks, over the last month, is coming from home building stocks which are benefiting from uh, fallen mortgage rates. But these aren't the big stories. The real stories are the next few charts. So that was just a little bit of a prelude. These are, the, I'm gonna show you now this, the uh, sectors that have yet to hit new highs. Now remember, this was written a couple of days ago, so markets are bounced, uh, bouncing a little bit here. We're gonna start with communicate. These are sort of done in, in order of uh, relative strength or relative weakness, starting with the strongest one. This simply shows the communication services Select Spider XLC, which is one of the newer indexes. And you can see that um, during July, when we ran up, uh, uh, looked like we were about to hit a new high. We backed off pretty sharply. It was just in the process of testing last year's highs, by the way. Maybe that's just purely coincidence. So the highs of this July are testing the highs of last July. Um, maybe that's a seasonal thing. I don't know. I was simply making the case, though, that here's, here's a sector that failed a test of a recent high. We have pulled back a little bit, nothing too serious, but uh, it just concerns me. Whenever I see a group that is pulling back from the record high, concerns me a little bit. Move down to the next chart, we saw, see essentially the same thing. This is the industrials. Ah. Uh, there you go. <laughs> you can see that last, that last red circle there. This was the high that was formed uh, again during July. And if you look back, this is just basic, simple chart analysis, nothing fancy here. You can see that. Um, we have reached this level twice before, this spring during April, and uh, again, last September, October. So is it a warning signal? Maybe not, but it's just a sign that here's another group that e even though the, the S&P and, and hitting a new high record highs, here's a very economically sensitive group that uh, failed to hit a new high. By the way, Tom, you mentioned uh, transportation stocks before. Transport I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't sound right, but transportation stocks are, in, are included in the industrial spider. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out recently that weakness in the transportation group has been one of the things pulling this down. But here again, no serious damage being done. You can see we've come down to the, remember this is two days old. We come down to the 200 day moving average and we're bouncing off it very nicely. So there's no serious damage being done here. I'm just a little bit concerned about the inability of this particular spider and some of the others to hit record highs. If you move down, we're gonna see essentially the same thing. Move to the next chart. Here's healthcare, same thing. We moved up uh, third red circle here. It's the same, same thing over and over again. You can simply see that, uh, you can just simply see that where we're up against the old highs that were formed last year, uh, pulling back, nothing too serious. We did slip a little bit below the 200 day, but we're back above it today. So nothing serious. I'm just a little bit concerned about the inability uh, to hit new highs. And if we keep going, Aaron, we'll see the same chart here again, materials, XLB. Once again, you can see that we're up against that trend line there. Those are the highs that we had hit last September. We pull back a little bit, nothing too serious, but still inability to hit new highs. This particular index did also bounce off its 200-day moving average uh, yesterday. One thing about the materials, and I think I've mentioned this yesterday, for example, or, or, let's say over the last week. In fact, yet, yesterday materials were the strongest sector in the market. That may not seem to make a lot of sense, but if you look beneath the surface a little bit, the group that's been leading materials higher are gold mining stocks. And as you know, gold has uh, hit a six-year high. It's trading over $1,500 an ounce for the first time in six years. Gold mining stocks 
I read in the paper today, they're up something like 40% in the last three months. I mean, that, that's incredible. So money has been pouring into gold, and that is what has been supporting, not necessarily today, but that's what has been supporting the materials. And at the same time, we're seeing money coming out of copper stocks, steel stocks, aluminum stocks. Copper, for example, hit a new low uh, this last week. So we're seeing money flowing into gold stocks, coming out of industrial metals. So that's not a sign of strength, actually. Though it, it helps the materials, it's actually a sign, in my view, it's a sign of caution. Okay, let's go to the next one. These are all showing the same thing. I guess I should apologize for that. But uh, these are the financial stocks. You can see, once again, up against the old highs, the red circles, backing off. Again, nothing serious going on here to the downside. By the way, financials also, just to update this verbally, also bounced off their 200-day moving average yesterday. I've, I've been very concerned about weakness in the financials, banks in particular. But with the yields climbing to the, this group, and of all the groups that we've looked at, gets hurt the most by falling interest rates. Bond yields are very negative for financial stocks and bank stocks in particular. So uh, this group, uh, I just wanted to make the point that it, it has pulled back from that, that uh, all-time high. So this is another group that has yet to hit a new high. They may very well do so at some point in the future, but they haven't yet. We did come down yesterday. We bounced off that 200-day moving average. In fact, financials are one of today's strongest sectors, uh, and, that, and that is because of the, the bounce in yields. So all these things are... All these things are, are correlated. And then we'll just move down to the fast, uh, last one. I guess I'll just mention this. It's not really part of this story, but energy stocks, as you can see, this is by far, this is the XLE. We're using all of the, all of the spiders here. This is by far the weakest sector of the stock market. We, we hit new lows just this week. And of course, that's tied to the price of oil. Uh, oil uh, is, at, it's, is at its lowest level since the beginning of the year. Oil has been plunging recently. It was down another 5% yesterday. And here, and by the way, I'll just mention this last point before I leave these charts just to make, this, to make a case. This is also tied, in my view, the fact that commodity prices have been so weak. I'm not talking about gold. That's a whole different thing. The price of oil, the price of copper, um, well, those are the two most important ones, have been so weak. That is anti-inflationary. And that's one of them. I've shown charts before that if you take the price of oil or the price of copper and put them up against interest rates, they're very, very highly correlated. So the falling bond yields are symptomatic not just of a lower uh, global growth, but lower global inflation. And that's what we're seeing here. So um, now I, want, I do want to correct one thing. Uh, I've, been, listen, I've been hearing on CNBC over the last few days that rising gold prices are a harbinger of inflation. That is absolutely not true. Most commodities are falling sharply. Gold prices is the only one going up. It has nothing to do with inflation. It's uh, simply uh, it's simply a flight to a, a, a haven currency, uh, not a not a currency, but a, a haven of gold at a time when global yields are plunging all over the world and people are beginning to worry about the global growth. So uh, gold is not going up because of inflation. It's a whole different whole different uh, thing going on. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's going up because of a little deflation creeping in. So I think that's enough of my charts, Tom and Aaron. I think I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to you at this point. If you want to ask any questions or look at anything else, it's up to you. Yeah, I have a question on that last comment you made. I mean, you know, we just had the Federal Reserve come out and uh, they stated that, you know, they were cutting a quarter point, but they really didn't give the market any guidance as to what they were going to do in the future. And of course, we're seeing central bankers around the globe that are quite dovish. And the U.S. is now being viewed as not so dovish. And so I guess my question, you know, when you see energy charts going down uh, or prices going down, you see copper prices going down. And, you know, we look at this potentially disinflationary environment and even the feds acknowledge that. Do you think that the Fed should continue cutting? I think that I don't think they have any choice, Tom. By the way, come back. You mentioned the dollar before in gold. This is this is the real impact of the rising dollar. You look at other, you know, when the rising dollar goes up, that is normally the dollar goes up. That is normally bearish for commodity price. We are seeing it here. We're seeing it here in copper. It's just not gold because gold is is, is in a whole different whole different area. I don't think the Fed has any choice, Tom. I, I've I've seen the things now that uh, the betting is now they're going they're going to be under two percent by the end of the year. So. I don't think the Fed ha has too much choice here. Uh, they're being pulled lower by global forces. Uh, I don't think they really uh, have too much of a choice. I think they're going to have to get 
a lot more aggressive, especially with all of the pressure coming from the White House for a weaker dollar. The only way you're going to weak, weaken the dollar is to, uh, is to uh, continue to lower interest rates. And let me just finish with this one point, Tom. It bothers me a little bit. I know I've written about this. I keep reading the reason, it, uh, the reason central bankers around the world are getting so dovish at this point is because rates are so low at this point, they're historically so low, that they don't have any ammunition left when the next recession hits. So their strategy is to get aggressive now in order to prevent the recession. Well, you can't prevent the recession, you can only postpone it. And my feeling is, yes, that, that may help, but what are they going to do when the next recession hits? When rates are gonna be zero, 1%, what ammunition do the central bankers have when the next recession finally hits? And that's the thing that really worries me. All right, well, when that question comes up, I'm gonna be looking and checking out your market message to find out what the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> I always look to you, John. When I have questions I can't answer, I look to your, your uh, market message. Really? I, that's why I read yours in the morning. I get my <laughs> oh, ideas from you. <laughs> Checks in the mail. Appreciate that. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I got another question here for you. We talked a little bit earlier about um, the transportation stock. Yeah, John, I tell you, as long as click, can you click on this message here? Because I have a transportation stock in uh, transportation. Can you do yeah. that? Yes, let's do it. Okay, go, go on further down to the bottom of the chart. Uh, you'll see a transportation index in there. Where is it? The last one, right there. Trans, transport. There you go. I showed that yesterday. So, I, so your question was the divergence between uh, the Dow Industrials. This is another thing that worries me when I look at the longer term picture. The Dow Industrials, we know they hit new highs recently. Um, historically, that traditional Dow theory in a, in a, in a good, strong bull market, the industrials and the transports should be moving up together. And as you can see, and this only goes back, if you went back even another year, you'd see this looks even worse. Um, the disparity is really very, very disturbing. The point of this chart, by the way, yes, this was done late yesterday, was to show that the transports had fallen under their 200 day moving average, but we were still above support. Last time I looked, I think they're back above that moving average today. Transports are rallying very nicely today. But still, there is a, a, an extremely wide divergence here between the industrials and the transportation stocks. This is another thing that worries me a little bit. And by the way, just to throw one more wrinkle into that, if you throw the utilities into it, utilities have been the strongest of the three. <laughs> that is a defensive. So not only, not only uh, are the transports underperforming the industrials, but the utility stocks, which are defensive, are outperforming both of them. So when you put these together, it doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in the longer range picture for the stock market. And that does concern me a little bit. But the fact that we were able to, the fact that the trans, I, I did write last night that even though they were looking a little shaky here, it was very important that they stay above that early June low. And they appear to be doing that. Small caps, by the way, uh, if you, if you want to move up to the chart just above it, you see small caps, exact same thing. This is another thing that worries me very much. Small caps have been underperforming by a wide margin under the 200-day moving average, but, but still above the June low. They're also rallying quite strongly today. So even though they're, um, they're, they're very weak on a relative basis, and that does concern me quite a bit, in a really strong market, the small caps should participate. We did manage to hold above support, and we are rallying again today. So maybe there's some good news on that. And then I'll beg your indulgence, Tom, to just go to one more chart just above that. And this is another one that's a little more, uh, maybe a little more critical. I mentioned um, the fact that bank stocks uh, usually get hurt by falling yields. You can see bank stocks have also done quite badly under the under the uh, 200 day. But I also pointed out last night that they're also sitting right on chart support. This is a very critical spot for this chart. The good news is that banks are rallying very strongly today on the bank, bank uh, on the, uh, the big jump in bond yields. So the good news is that banks, uh, small caps and transports, which have been showing relative weakness, are all bouncing off some very key support levels today. So uh, maybe there's some good news in that. All right, can I, uh, I wanna go over a chart if you don't mind, um, and I'm gonna just pull it up here and show you and get your thoughts on this, because I think this is, kind of gets it to the heart of the poll question today, which is whether or not um, our audience believes the, uh, 
the Dow Jones Industrial Average can move back to new highs, or, or maybe it was the S&P 500, but can we move back to new highs without support from the transport? So this is a 10-year weekly chart. On the top, you've got the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and on the bottom, you've got the Dow Jones uh, Transportation Average. And so if you look back to 2012, the, the blue dotted vertical line tell, shows you that the Dow Jones Industrial Average was breaking out to a new high in 2012. But when we look down here, the transports were not. And in fact, over the next year, transport struggled and so did the Dow. But as soon as the transports broke out in 2013, then we saw a big rally in the Dow and in transports. And then we did the same thing over again back in 2016, where the Dow broke out above those prior highs and transports were nowhere near a breakout. And for the next several months, the Dow really struggled to, to move higher until transports rallied and got their breakout. And then once that happened, we had another huge rally. So I'm looking at it now, and the Dow just made another all-time high just a few weeks ago. And transports, like you mentioned, we've been going down for the last year. I mean, it's been since almost last summer since we've seen a high in the transport. So I guess that's the reason for the poll question. You know, can we go higher in the Dow Jones, in your opinion, without the transports coming up and confirming? And, and what do you make of this chart, if anything? Well, I, of course, it can happen, Tom. We've seen it happen. It happened just a month ago. The Dow hit a record high. But it's just not a good combination. You know, we are, bear in mind, we're, what, 11 years into this bull market or the 10th year, the longest bull market in history, the longest economic expansion in history. So, you know, you begin to look for trouble, trouble signs, and this is certainly one of them. The Dow transports have not confirmed the move into new highs, not to mention the six sectors that I showed you just a few minutes ago. So um, the fact that, the, and by the way, the, the groups that are in this are very economically sensitive, like the rails, the truckers, delivery services. Remember UPS uh, collapsed, uh, was it UPS collapsed about a month ago? These are very economically sensitive stocks. They also tell us something about the global economy. So uh, the fact that, let's put it this way, it's not, a good, it's not a good thing when the transports are lagging this far behind. I would feel a lot better if the transportation stocks started to break through some overhead resistance. It looked like we were trying to do it about a month ago, but it didn't last. And also, I'll just kick in. I would also like to see the transports start to outperform the utilities. That would be another good sign. Absolutely. I got uh, maybe one quick question before we wrap up with you, John. Um, the first one I think I can probably answer for you. There was a question, if the Fed goes to zero rates and the economy and markets continue to fall, then what do they do? And I think you said- Zero rates. <laughs> what do they do? That's a really good question, right? What, what do they do? What's, what's the next plan? What's the plan for the next downturn? Well, look, we have negative rates in Japan for three years. Nothing's happened there. We've had negative uh, rates in uh, Europe for almost two years, three years. Nothing's happened there. So it, it, why, why, that's, that is not the definition of insanity, to keep doing the same thing over and over again. <laughs> expected. I'm not calling anybody insane. But I'm simply saying I understand why they're doing it because it's the only thing they know how to do, but it doesn't seem to be working. Uh, and I'm afraid we may be heading, we may be forced to go along that same path. That may not be terrible for now, but the other thing that bothers me, they said the Fed's going to have to ease because things are looking a lot worse. Well, that's not very encouraging. Yeah. They're being forced to ease because things are weakening. Well, that doesn't make me feel good. Yeah. All right. Well, I tell you what, it was uh, great having you on here. It's always great to have you on here, John, especially when the market's so trying, you know, with all the, the uh, difficulties that we've been having to sustain our moves to the upside. Uh, great to have your wisdom here on the show and uh, really appreciate you stopping by. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for inviting me. The Chart Watchers newsletter features expert technical commentary about the current market from some of the industry's leading technical analysts. See what's really happening in the markets through their eyes and gain an edge in your own investing. The newsletter is packed full of insightful and educational articles intended to help you become a better investor. Whether you are brand new to charting or a seasoned technical analyst, each edition will provide a wealth of informative content. It's the best way to stay informed on all the latest news, events, updates, and additions here at StockCharts.com. Whether it's a new feature or blog, an upcoming conference, or a special sale, you'll hear it first in the Chart Watchers newsletter.